Hi, so in this first video for week three, I'd like to begin by talking about the diagnostic process using the DSM-5, some of the differences between the DSM-5 and the DSM-4-TR, a little mention of the ICD-10, and then I'd like to talk a little bit about um, some of, the, some of the other unexpected impacts of uh, opioid addiction, including poor decision making and some of the physical uh, impacts of this addiction. And then um, we'll follow up with a few more videos uh, looking in depth at each one of the different kinds of uh, opioids. Um, and uh, to give you insight into how each one works, what each one is, uh, why uh, different individuals would choose different substances for their addictions, for their drug of choice. So um, I did write some notes, so please forgive me if I'm not looking at exactly at the camera. I want to make sure I include everything and um, phrase it uh, exactly right. Um, so uh, looking at um, diagnosing uh, the substance use disorder, specifically opioids, um, most people think it's, it's a simple process, but, but it's not. It's, there's a lot of depth to this diagnostic process. Most counselors might think, oh, well, if they're using uh, substances, that decides the diagnosis. Um, if they're experiencing addiction or fulfilling the criteria, well, yes, but let's look at it a little more in depth uh, than just that. So just to be comprehensive, in the diagnostic process, we should use a multiple uh, di uh, diagnostic assessment. So, of course, we have self-reporting by uh, the client, um, but we should also look at some of the different domains, uh, if possible, talk with them, but at least look at the effects on those other domains, including uh, relationships, family of origin, current relationships, current family, spouse, significant others, um, current social network, any support network, um, work or academics if they're in school, and uh, their physical implications. Uh, and the physical implications include both a medical diagnosis uh, and not just for um, substance use, uh, as well as lab tests regarding substance use. Um, the uh, self-report and uh, other domains, talking with other individuals, uh, involves questionnaires. Uh, we'll look at very specific questionnaires that are recommended. Um, so as we begin the interview process, uh, we really want to know things like what age did you begin using any substance, including tobacco and alcohol? Um, what's the timeline and progression of use? Did you use multiple substances? Did, did you transition from one substance to another? Um, and uh, what was the use of each substance like? Uh, severity. Um, what are the amounts of each substance? What is the frequency in usage of each substance? Uh, both historically on the timeline throughout their life, and most importantly, what is it recently, over the last month? 
um, and uh, have they had any previous treatment? Have they gone through detox previously? Were they unsuccessful? Were they successful and is this a relapse? Um, did they receive treatment for a different substance? Uh, also, we really want to look at comorbid diagnoses, as I said in previous lectures. So many drug treatment facilities do not look at comorbid diagnoses. And as we look at the comorbid diagnoses, we want to figure out, was this other diagnosis, like anxiety, depression, or some other one, um, present before the substance use? So is the substance use part of self-medication? Um, are they unrelated? Is the comorbid diagnosis a result of substance use? Is it a result of withdrawal symptomology? Is it a result of uh, brain damage from substance abuse? Is there a physical attribute to the comorbid diagnosis? Or is it just a psychological attribute? So we really want to get into that. We also want to include a medical physical from a medical doctor uh, to see what other impacts are involved. Um, to see, for instance, are they having experiencing uh, heart problems as they go through withdrawal symptomology. Um, and that, that uh, process involves the ICD-10, which is the medical uh, diagnostic handbook. And then uh, we also um, want to include uh, screening for HIV, AIDS, um, and uh, anything anything else. Uh, so it could include things like uh, any any other uh, physical virus. Um, there's so many, uh, but hepatitis, any version of hepatitis. Uh, include and HIV are the two big ones because of the needle sharing. Um, but there are a lot of other uh, viruses, types of bacteria uh, that could have been um, transmitted. Uh, and then um, we want to include a basic mental status exam in the very first session because we want to assess, is there any suicidal ideation? Uh, is there any um, disturbance in uh, reality uh, or their perception of reality? And so we want to include a basic mental status exam. Um, I also want to go over some of the specific um, assessments that can be used. Most of these take the form of questionnaires. Some are longer and more in-depth and some are brief. Could be answered on a piece of paper in the waiting room. Um, first one, the Addiction Severity Index, ASI. It's been validated as an assessment tool for this purpose. It's been used in research and clinical programs since the 1990s. Uh, it's been modified since then to include uh, new substances. Um, the ASI provides a computer-generated composite score, can be used as a baseline for determining the severity of an addiction, and it assesses improvement as the patient 
completes treatment. The ASI composite score provides psychometric assessment of functioning in seven domains, drug use, alcohol use, psychiatric, medical, family, legal, and employment status. And uh, this brought up one other aspect that we really need to incorporate as we go through the interview and diagnostic process. Are they experiencing any legal uh, problems? Um, and where are they in that process? Do they need referrals? Um, have they been referred to us as a result of court-mandated treatment? Um, one of the problems with the ASI is it takes a long time to use, and uh, it's computerized now. But the next one, the Brief Addiction Monitor, the BAM, B-A-M, uh, has been established recently. It's a substitute for the ASI, composed of 17 questions. So it's extremely brief, it can be completed by patients without staff. Patients can fill it out in the waiting areas uh, before a scheduled appointment. It can be written by hand in a few minutes. Um, it's not as thorough as the ASI, covering uh, a multitude of areas and severity. Another one is the Drug Abuse Screening Test, the DAST, 28-item self-report assessment instrument found to exhibit validity and sensitivity for screening for drug abuse other than alcohol. Um, so those are three of the most popular ones. Um, as we begin to look at criteria from the DSM-5, I did post the criteria um, for the DSM-5, so please read through that criteria that I posted. And um, I just want to point out some of the differences with the new DSM-5 from previous versions. Uh, it resolved the issue of having two discrete entities for diagnosing opioid addiction. They merged the two DSM-4-TR diagnoses into one spectrum called opioid use disorders. They deleted one of the criteria of substance abuse, which is the legal problems associated with substance. They added one new criterion, which is craving for substance use. The total number of criteria which can be used to diagnose substance use disorder is 11. They further classified the substance use disorders into mild, moderate, or severe, depending on the number of criteria that the patient has at the time of being diagnosed. I, I would personally say that severity requires more than just the number of criteria. Um, it requires uh, length of use. Um, severity requires um, how often they use. What is the amount of the substance use? Uh, things like that as well. Um, other tools are also uh, used for SUD or substance use disorder. The International Classification of Disease, that's the ICD, they're on volume 10, edition 10, uh, used in Europe and elsewhere. Um, a lot of times you can use both, uh, a combination of the DSM and the ICD. And some, some new insurance uh, is, is requiring both. Um, and it's good to be familiar with the ICD anyway, and you should probably have a copy of it at your disposal. I also want to talk about, in the second half of this specific lecture, I'd like to talk about um, some of the other impacts, some of the, the physical impacts. Um, OIC 
uh, is a physical result of opioid use, even opioid use in hospital settings. Uh, people can experience this, and it stands for opioid-induced constipation, and it's a little more severe than uh, what one might experience every now and then from something they ate or uh, didn't eat, and um, it's, a, it's a result of the way opioids affect the digestive system. So, what, what's actually occurring is that uh, it's not allowing uh, intestines, colon, uh, to experience stimulation. And uh, so um, it takes longer uh, to expel. And uh, as a result, constipation occurs. And this can be severe enough to be hospitalized for the, the constipation. Um, so another potential long-term effect is a potential change in brain chemistry. Uh, so may or may not heal over time. Uh, this could have an effect on a person's pain tolerance, mood, libido, cognitive functioning. So remember I talked about cognitive restructuring, cognitive remapping, but it can also cause various aspects of brain damage. And we're going to talk about that uh, as well. So some other potential side effects could include reduced fertility, immune system depletion, irregular menses for women, testosterone depletion for men, intestinal damage, and liver damage. Those are the primary uh, health impacts uh, for the physical domain. Now, one final area I'd like to point out in this particular lecture is the resulting faulty decision-making process that results from opioid use disorder. Um, so opioid addicted persons would come to a point in their addiction where their judgment would be totally impaired as the result of their addictive opioid use. At this point, they continuously make unhealthy decisions, which may lead to long-term consequences. One example would be sharing of uh, needles um, could result in hepatitis C uh, or uh, HIV. But we can also look at uh, the immediate uh, gratification associated with active opioid use due to the euphoric effect can impair the individual's judgment, leading to impulsive and unhealthy decisions. Um, and there are basically uh, three components to faulty decision-making. Uh, one is chasing that high or euphoria and wanting the immediate gratification. One is trying to avoid withdrawal symptoms or withdrawal symptoms. And another is cravings. So those are the emotional uh, aspects uh, resulting from addiction or withdrawal. And one other component is uh, poor decision making mm -hmm. resulting from uh, cognitive impairment from different types of brain damage. Um, many Addiction count counselors and researchers compare some of these faulty, faulty decision-making processes to gambling addiction, uh, which I thought was pretty interesting. And they really wanted to connect the way people make decisions in that process. Uh, heroin addicts are 
at increased risk for faulty decision making due to functional and structural changes in their brains. So here we're looking at actual physical changes. It's not clear at the present time if these changes are permanent or transient. The decision making process involves several areas of the brain. Five main circuits connect the basal ganglia with the cerebral cortex. These circuits include motor and oculomotor uh, circuits, motor loops, the dorsal lateral prefrontal circuit, the lateral orbital frontal circuit, and the anterior cingulate circuit, the limbic loop. You don't have to remember all those, um, but uh, these circuits are connecting the basal gang ganglia to the cerebral cortex. Um, and if uh, they have been challenged, uh, or um, if they aren't working properly, it affects our decision-making process on a physical level rather than just an emotional level. Recent data suggests that exchange of information between certain circuits takes place in certain situations. So uh, different circuits are used in different situations to process data and make decisions. So um, subcortical nuclei relate not only to motor control, but also to the process of reminding, as well as executive function processes, short-term memory, and the analysis of mutual setting of objects to undertaking actions. Therefore, the integrity of cortical and subcortical circuits is essential in formulating a healthy decision. Some studies reported that heroin could damage certain brain regions which may interrupt the cortico-subcortical circuits. And uh, some individuals, uh, Zilstra, Z-I-J-L-S-T-R-A, reported uh, in their imaging study using single photon emission computed tomography, or SPECT, S-P-E-C-T, and opioid dependent subjects had lower baseline dopamine type 2 receptors in the left caudate nucleus compared with normal subjects. And they also found that opioid dependent subjects demonstrated higher dopamine release after Q exposure to right putamen than controls. So they added that chronic craving and anhedonia were positively correlated with dopamine release, and this study confirms the possibility of the damage in the circuit connecting cortical and subcortical structures as a result of heroin use. In addition, uh, we can look at cabinet, uh, cognitive remapping, as we discussed earlier. But what's, what all of this is saying is that it damages our brain circuitry. And that affects everything from the decision-making process and cycle to uh, dopamine production. And all of these things are interrelated. And when you combine these with the use of opioids, you've really got some poor decision-making process because of wanting to avoid withdrawal, wanting the euphoria, wanting immediate gratification, and uh, all of the other components. Put the, all those things together, and you've got a lot of poor decision-making. Poor decision-making includes other risky behavior beyond needle sharing. It includes activity in crime, to get the substances. It includes disruption of relationships, manipulation, uh, risky sexuality, uh, including prostitution, um, and uh, being involved in abusive situations, including relationships that might involve everything from a 
emotional abuse, physical abuse, sexual abuse, neglect, things like that. Um, if the person who is addicted to the substance uh, is a parent, the children often suffer to a great extent as well. Okay, well thank you for listening to this first lecture in week three and we will be also going into each substance independently. Uh, then next week uh, we'll look at specific treatment programs that use other forms of medication and in week five we'll go into great detail into uh, counseling, therapeutic, talk therapies, and alternative therapies and uh, that you could use in conjunction with uh, other medications or independently. All right, thank you very much.